Reimagining development in our rural community is certainly a thought-provoking statement. To reimagine something, we need to step back, let go of some of our past practices, and reflect on what is truly important to us in order to move forward. We're not suggesting that development should stop. In fact, we feel that development is good. We just, uh, we just need to have development in the right places, uh, using evidence-based information, with input from all stakeholders, including the residents. ERAM is asking all interested parties to imagine a future of, of development in Oromodonte differently. So frequently we hear residents ask questions like, why did the developer clear that clear cut that land and look at the erosion and flooding that has resulted? Or who approved that retaining wall? Or why didn't I know about this before now? Often people become concerned about issues like this long after the plans have been approved and construction has already begun. We would like to encourage the people of our beautiful township to not focus on what has happened in the past, but to create a vision for the future. Eram's vision is a township where our natural heritage is valued and protected, and where evidence-based research about the oral moraine is used as one of the principles in planning for the future. Our vision would include addressing, addressing climate change, affordable housing, and the needs of our young and aging residents. We want to see protections for the moraine, natural heritage, and farmlands front and center in the guiding documents of our township. These are some, just some of our ideas, but we're sure that you have many more. In our current state, residents do have an opportunity to provide feedback about decisions affecting their communities, but we are just one voice. There are strong, possibly stronger voices when it comes to planning. We've got developers, the county, the province, and even some municipalities like Aurelia and Barrie all have a very strong influence on our futures. We imagine a township where the constituent's voice is equally as strong and residents have an opportunity to be at the same table with the other stakeholders planning for the future. We ask, why can't we set our expectations this high? Why can't we say Oromodonte is an incredibly special place? And to be part of this township, we are asking you to set standards as high as we have. It's time to start figuring out how to make this happen, rather than dwelling on why it can't happen. We're talking about a culture change. This will take a lot of time and a lot of effort, but what better time to start than now? And on that note, I'm going to uh, ask Hartley Woodside to introduce our very, very special guest speaker. Is there someone else? <laughs> <laughs> it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Sean today. I'm Hartley Woodside. I want to say how fortunate we are to have Sean here today. We hope that this will be the first in a series of explorations intended to open our minds to an expansive and inclusive future for Oromodonte. Sean is the principal in Sean Hurtle Planning, a lecturer at the Toronto Metropolitan University, York University, and the University of Waterloo. He is a land use planner with 25 years of experience as a policy and implementation expert, and has worked with the City of Toronto, with Emory Village, BIA, the Region of Peel, the Greenbelt Foundation, Saugeen Shores, and many more. In York Region, for example, Sean was engaged to consult on a planning vision, provide advice to staff, and to run two open houses and four focus groups for equity-deserving residents. In 2022, he undertook an update to the Greenbelt Foundation's Global Greenbelt Research, mm. studying how global greenbelts are evolving. Saugeen Shores is where we first encountered him. His voice turned up on an entertaining podcast hosted by the planners of Saugeen Shores, a novel and engaging podcast idea. Saugeen Shores is a township on Lake Huron where Sean was engaged in exploring the use of community planning permits as a means for developing a community vision while also encouraging affordable housing. I am sure he will have more to say on this particular planning tool. Sean once lived in Oromodonte, something we did not know when we started down this road, and has a fondness and understanding of our township and connections with Simcoe County through his work. 
He recoils, however, at the idea that he, an outsider, should tell us how to go about things. He is here to speak from his experience and to offer insight into the workings of the planner's mind. Finally, he describes himself as a visionary incrementalist, which is such an evocative phrase that I think I will take that as my cue for exit. Oh, <laughs> oh, thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, everybody. It's, um, it's, it's, oh. Do I use this too? <laughs> I usually don't need these, but I understand we're recording. Um, uh, very, very few times do I have to use a microphone in lecture hall uh, when I'm speaking. So, and I do like to move around, but I don't want to trip on any cords. Um, but thank you so much, and, and truly, uh, I am humbled and I am honored to be here. And like you, um, I really care. Uh, but unlike you, I haven't lived here my whole life. I have a short, short but good experience of living here in Oran Medante. And I think it was, you know, fate that I got asked to come here um, through such projects as, you know, Sogging Shores. I never, ever would have thought that the road to Oramadani came through Sogging Shores. <laughs> New slogan if you're trying anything out, you know, maybe you can. Anyway, thank you for being here. Um, yes, um, recoil was an interesting term because I feel very, I love sharing my insights and I love listening, but I, I'm very sensitive. I came from a small town myself outside of Windsor, Ontario, and I always bristled when, when experts would come in and tell us what to do and tell us what a poor job we were doing and then leave, <laughs> right? It's not a great feeling. So I come with that sensibility, and I'm here as someone who is curious, as someone who thinks that, you know, let's contribute to a bigger conversation, and as Linda and Hartley were saying, have that conversation continue. Let's not just show up and then, then that's it. You know, as a planner who've worked with many municipalities, the most successful municipalities are those that not only initiate, but sustain that level of engagement and learning. And it's work, right? It's a lot of work. Um, politicians and civic leaders need to listen and show up, and residents need to do the same. And everyone needs to be educated and ask good questions and be prepared to hear answers that they might not want to hear, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's, that's my offer today. And if I can help stimulate that conversation and I can maybe inspire different ways of looking at things, maybe ask some tough questions, then I, I think I'd do my job and I would love to continue. Not that I'm inviting myself back, but I, I'd love to be in touch and, and see how you're doing and, and provide some advice. Um, and give some ideas and uh, thank you. What, what, what you've pulled off here just, just in the last few minutes is really inspiring as someone who's worked in many municipalities. Um, too often times, and, and our politicians in the room will, council will definitely probably attest to this, too often times when we get people in a room it's because something's going wrong or someone's fearful of something. You know, everyone comes up um, there's this big bad development coming or something's pretty clear cut. Usually something's wrong and they're reacting to it. But we're all here. The world's not ending. Everything's okay. There aren't bulldozers outside. We're here because we want to be here. And I think that's a great start. And as a planner, that's a great environment. So my presentation, notwithstanding I've t already talked longer than I thought, um, my presentation is very short. One of the very shortest I think I've ever put together. Okay? However, yeah, you are going to get your money's worth. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> However, what I want to do is, is just offer a couple of small thoughts. And then we can open it up. And I'd like to engage with you and listen to you and, and, and learn and then we can take it from there. How does that sound, everybody? And please ask away. I do have some experience. I, I don't know everything, but I think sometimes asking good questions is more important than coming up with half answers. Great, so you may not be able to see this, but this is something that is generated by uh, artificial intelligence. 
Um, I'm not a, an early adopter of artificial intelligence because I don't think that we've mastered actual intelligence yet. <laughs> right? We got to get that right first, don't we? Um, but I wanted to see, I took a lot of keywords from your official plan, such as sustainability, rural character, um, pedestrian activity, economic vibrancy, um, environmental sustainability, and this is what popped out. Isn't that interesting? Um, you see kind of a rural um, aesthetic. You have a, have a hill, you've got a little bit of a kind of a New, new Englandish uh, ch church steeple. Interesting to note that there are no cars in this picture. It's interesting how, and I, I know that's not realistic, right? But I think it's interesting how when we use words like um, community character and culture and sustainability, cars are usually never present. But cars are reality. We, I think we all drove here, didn't we? Right? So imagine maybe the parking lot's over here. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I didn't get that far. But those are those things that we have to be honest about, right? I'm a transportation planner. I do a lot of subway work. But guess what? I drive to the subway meetings in Toronto because I don't want to be late. <laughs> so we have, to, we have to reconcile with some very uncomfortable realities. And that's OK. We have to lean into them, right? So I just thought this would be a neat way to start. Okay, so just quickly about, I'm a movie fan, so I apologize in advance. If you don't get that reference, I'll be happy to explain later. Um, so I am a professional um, urban planner or region, uh, urban and regional planner, city planner, municipal planner. Um, the, the term is registered professional planner. Um, Oftentimes, I have to explain that I don't do weddings. <laughs> and this is a picture from the very funny, but not necessarily safe for work or family appropriate, uh, the hangover uh, with the wedding party. Um, we talk a lot about the, the public interest when we do formal planning. And it's interesting because I, I ask, well, who is the public and what are their interests? Now, you are the public. I don't think you were sent here uh, under false pretenses from, from Sogging Shores or anyone else. Everyone's legit. I don't know if you, t you checked uh, addresses, Deputy Mayor, at the front. <laughs> Any people undercover from Barrie here? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I tend to do that. Um, so yes, you are the public. But are you a complete picture of the public who live in Oro Medante? Probably not. Probably not. And that's not an indictment, right? It's just a reality. So one thing as a planner, I would say, well, is the public interest and the neighborhood interest always the same? And it might not be. What might be best for a certain neighborhood may not be better for the entire public. So it's planners' jobs to follow the evidence to say, what's really going on? What's really needed? Who are we really planning for? And one of the questions I like to ask myself, to challenge myself, is who's not in the room? Right, Linda, you mentioned um, older people, younger people. What about the residents who aren't here yet? So we'll get to that. And if, I, if I'm a little romantic and thoughtful about planning, it's because I think you have to be. Like, I love communities. I love cities. I love regions. Because when we go to a place, we usually find ourselves going to the museum or an art gallery to see what it's all about. But what we don't realize is that the city, the region, the town, the community, the neighborhood, that itself is the museum. That is everything that humankind has ever created, all hopes and dreams our catastrophes, our successes, our losses, our gains, all reflected in the communities around us. And that's a beautiful thing. So then we ask ourselves, is this the best we can do? Does this reflect who we are and our values? 
are we okay with leaving this to the next generation? And it's something I challenge myself with all the time. So quick, planning is usually at least 25 years, but then we run into a math problem, don't we? Infrastructure, maybe not what we've been building lately, but theoretically, infrastructure should last a lot longer than 25 years, right? So plans last 25 years. Terms of council are every four. And then in between, you have a federal election, a provincial election, maybe a by-election, and so what's happening is, is if we're planning for the future, we have all of these short-term loops of political decisions, of interest rate shocks, we're in one right now. Um, there's so many things that we can't control. And so what starts off as 25 years never really seems to be long-term because a lot of times we're always reacting. And I think what Iram is trying to do Let's think a little bit bigger and a little bit longer to figure out what it is we're, we're moving to, notwithstanding that your official plan already does that. But official plans aren't born in a, in a vacuum, right? They're political and they're legal instruments that are susceptible to all kinds of shocks. Climate change, floodplains, I've only been practicing for 25 years. Floodplains are different when I started. 25 year storms are five year storms now. 100 year storms are every 25 years now. So we have infrastructure and environmental regulations in place today that were drawn up in a different climate. And it's going to um, get, I don't want, want to say worse, but, well, it probably is, <laughs> but we're going to, things are changing faster and faster, and the stakes are getting higher and higher. So can we be prepared for the unexpected, right? One thing I like to say is, I plan for the future, I just don't know what it is. <laughs> but it's true, right? So a big part of planning is, well, where's the change gonna occur, and where is change not gonna occur? Where do we want things to happen, and where do we don't want things to happen, right? And where, do, where is the land that's gonna be used for residential, employment, retail, other activities, and what needs to be left alone, and also the buildings, the quality of the buildings, how they're connected to each other, how they serve, um, current and future residents and businesses, and can they trickle down to different uses? I don't know how resilient what we're building today is. It used to be we lived in homes that our, our grandparents and great-grandparents and people you knew down the street originally built, added on to, and then they got filtered down through generation through generation. Sometimes there's 10 people living in them, and some people it's 10 cats and one person. But they, but they always, but they serve their purpose. And I'm wondering how adaptable what we're building today is, right? Not just in Oran Radane, anywhere, anywhere. So I think, too, is part of planning is setting expectations for new development or changes to existing development. What's the quality like? What's the use like? Um, what, are, what about building materials? Um, how does it relate to the street? How does it perform environmentally? Energy. What kind of community spaces are? What does it bring with it? What are some of the community benefits that this building will bring, not just to the owners of the property, but the larger community? And I think that among many other reasons, that's probably why Iran brought you all here today, to at least begin the conversation of what do we expect of development? What are our values? What are our principles? What can development do for us that we, that we think is required and important? This is your plan. I've ne to be honest, I've never been to a non- specific, uh, non-development specific meeting where there's land use schedules from the official plan and the actual official plan is here in hard copy. 
you are my people. <laughs> you know, I, I, I love it. You guys are fantastic already. Um, I put in a pos uh, an exclamation mark because this is your plan. It's not the township's plan. It's not, with all respect, it's not the mayor's plan. It's not it is council's plan, but it passes down. It's your plan. You are the residents of Ormadonna. This is your plan. So what does your plan say? And I quote, this, is, this says that this is one of the main principles of your plan, and it says, to provide a basis for protecting the township's natural heritage system while managing growth that will support and emphasize the township's unique character, diversity, civic identity, rural lifestyle, and cultural heritage features in a manner that has the greatest positive impact on the quality of life in Oramadante. Seems like I'm making wedding vows. <laughs> do, you, do you or do you not? No, <laughs> don't answer. <laughs> it's quite a mouthful. There's a lot there. So part of the, the problem with long-term planning is tempering, identifying and tempering expectations. And I think also being focused too, because we can't do everything all at once. Sometimes I feel scattered and I tell myself, okay, Sean, pick one and just get it done and then move to the next one, <laughs> right? So maybe that's something that through EROM and, and council you can discuss, well, what are our priorities? Everything is important, but what do we do next, right? What do we do next and how do we do it? And also a question is, why do we do what we do? I think the purpose of a process is more important than the process itself. Because if you know where you're going, you'll find a way to get there. But if you focus on the route, you might not know where you end up, right? And so much of planning is process driven. And it's easy, we'd be forgiven to, forget, uh, to, to not ask ourselves or remind ourselves, well, why are we doing this planning thing in the first place, <laughs> right? Sorry about the resolution, but your township is big, is, is big. And it's very diverse. Um, there are rural, um, rural and, and rural settlement areas, and there are hamlets, and there are employment lands, and there are settlement areas where most of the development is concentrated. And in between, there's industry agriculture and otherwise, natural spaces, natural features, infrastructure, highways, community centers, schools, you name it. And it's probably hard to say, well, what are we? What is our Madonna? Depends on where you are, right? We're not just one thing. That's a challenge as a planner. But it's also an opportunity because you can create many different experiences in many places for many different types of people at different points in their life. But that's also really tough. It's a, it's a technical problem and it's also a political problem. So quick highlights. Like many other plans, this plan is a 2030 one horizon, moving to 2051, waiting for direction, aren't we? <laughs> and what's happening at the province is probably going to have quite a bearing on that. Protecting natural heritage. Um, little change is expected according to the plan in most areas, except concentrating development in the two settlement areas of Craighurst and Horseshoe Valley. But that doesn't mean, according to the plan, but some change can't happen in some of the hamlets, like Guthrie. But small scale, incremental, um, including infill residential, where it makes sense, right? This is my last slide. And I was a little unexpected you, because I was, I was telling Hartley and Linda, I don't consider myself an environmental planner. But I believe that building a good city, you know, building a good development 
is helping the environment if you use your resources wisely, right? And it struck me, I love, I love getting uh, lessons from nature. There's a small but hopefully emerging um, field of, of experimentation in science and social science called um, biomimicry, which says, well, what can we learn from nature? Nature does a lot right. It filters our water, it keeps things, our buildings stable, it provides the air we breathe, it gives us food. It does, a, it does a lot of free services for us that we can't do half as well. So what can we learn? And I thought this would be an interesting way to kind of end sort of the official formal kind of introduction to what I, what I know will be an amazing conversation is the eastern white cedar is, is native to this area. And it's the fastest, sorry, it's the slowest growing tree in the world. And there are species almost, um, there are specimens almost a 1,000 years old growing not too far from here on li limestone outcrops. And I'm thinking, well, what can we learn from this tree? is that it's small and compact and small growing and, and slow growing, not unlike a lot of our communities, right? It's not deeply rooted, but very strongly rooted. It doesn't grow in a lot of soil, but what it does grab onto, it's almost undetachable. And the reason why I thought this is very interesting because Oromadane is not expected to grow a lot. This is a different community. Um, we're not a, uh, I say, I don't mean to take credit for you, I say we, I, but, but you um, aren't a bedroom community. You shouldn't be, you don't want to be. You're a place on your, in your own right, right? So as such, you're going to be growing a little bit slower than other areas. You're not fending off a lot of track development, or you want to attract investment, but not overinvestment, right? So you may, your soil might not be very deep, in, metaphorically, in that way, but what you do have, you hang on to. You're very sure about it. And I think that's, that's something very instructive to how you're planning your community. And it survives and also thrives in not so great conditions. This thing, these things have endured drought, flood, fire, torrential winds, torrential weather events. It's still here. So it weathers the storm and also takes advantage of really good conditions as well. And that's what we should do. That's a good planning lesson, right? And it's and it's long it's long living. So much of what I've heard, you know, talking to Linda and Hartley and just pro practically half the room already when I just came, make me feel very welcome. I really appreciate um, e talking to everyone. Everyone uses an environmental metaphor here. The environment is obviously extremely important to you. So that's why I thought we'd bring in our friend, the Eastern White Cedar, because I think it might speak to the way that we look at our, our, our places and how we can see the future. So um, I think I, so here's my email. Not that, uh, not that Ibram will tell you how to get in touch with me. Um, I love what I do. I love speaking with people, I love learning, I love seeing new places, new faces. Um, I learn a tremendous amount and uh, to, to participate with such an engaged and enthusiastic bunch of people is, is really special. So I thank you and I really look forward to engaging with you and, and having a good chat. So thank you very much for listening to me. Okay, Sean, thank you so much. Once again, You're welcome. <laughs> once again, 
Um, we've had the opportunity to speak to Sean on several occasions through Zoom, and every time we all come away thinking, being inspired, and, and just really starting to think out of the box, and, and being hopeful as well. So I hope you gain some of that from him today. Um, we're not done. <laughs> so what we're going to do next is um, we have made up, we've created as a group some, some questions and we'd like to start our, our Q&A with a couple of questions that we will ask and then we'd like you to open up the uh, floor to, our, our, to you um, and uh, please talk away. Even if it's not a question, if it's just simply a comment, that would be really great as well. So don't feel that you have to, um, you know, come up with some, pre, you know, some very um, important question. Just comments are, are equally as important. So I'm going to start out, um, and I'm going to start out with my very first question. You okay? Yeah. Are we ready? Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Are you sure? <laughs> Just to let you know that yeah, Sean has not seen these questions and he's not heard them before. So this is, we're really putting him on the spot here. Okay. We've listened to a, uh, we listened to a um, presentation um, through, um, um, through, actually through SCGC and uh, Livable Ontario um, earlier in the week. And I, I, heard of, I heard the former provincial planner, Victor Doyle, make a very very interesting statement, and it really stuck with me, especially given what we were doing uh, this Sunday. He said, public participation is essential to good planning. Do you agree, Sean? No. <laughs> I haven't finished. I haven't finished. What if I said no? <laughs> okay. I haven't finished. My next statement is, or my question is, that's my statement. My question is, how can ordinary citizens become involved? In other words, how can the ordinary citizen be empowered to, to affect changes that we're talking about? Oh boy. Um, I, I think I should stand. I don't want to... Excellent question. Um, forgive me, I've got some, I've got some stories. Um, I was um, younger in, in, in my career, um, I was coming up with a, a quite a contra, I was asked, you know, ask the new guy. Uh, I was, I was, I uh, put together a, an intensification plan for the region of York uh, that predated the growth plan. So it was pretty dense and pretty scary for a traditionally, prototypically, you know, suburban municipality. And I, to be quite honest, I was really scared to go out in the public with it because it was very different than was currently in place. And people have certain expectations when they move to an area. And what we usually hear is, well, I moved from Toronto, so I wouldn't have towers. So I wouldn't have traffic. So I wouldn't have noise. What are you doing, right? I was really worried about that. So I'm not sure exactly how I came to this, <laughs> but I, I had a, a, a wonderful commissioner. Um, his name was Brian Tucky, and unfortunately, uh, Brian passed away uh, a few, uh, way too early, a few weeks ago. And, and Brian said, well, just go out and just talk to them. Just listen to them. Just, just share what you're thinking and why you're thinking it. And they might come around. They might surprise you. And they did. I was absolutely blown away because we met in forums like this. There was no application before them. There was no impending doom. It was, let's talk. And not only did the plan pass, it wasn't appealed, which was a miracle. And it actually improved with public input. Now, the public is our, has already been empowered, right? Because Theoretically, under the Planning Act, everyone has the opportunity to participate in the process. But many public processes don't feel very public through no one's fault, right? They're just like technically anyone can go to a court and you know, look at the proceedings. Technically, anyone can go to records and, and look at deeds and titles, but not many people do that. So the, the Unfortunately, the, the planning process is very much the same way, but you could argue that there's a lot more at stake. And usually the only thing that brought, brings people out is when 
there is a, um, a development that people don't like and they feel like they have to brace against. So what I would say to that question is to foster not just education, but a conversation like this, to formalize it through council, to formalize it through staff. Uh, the City of Toronto um, actually, I think, did have a, uh, I, don't, I don't say a lot of, um, I don't have a lot of good things to say about Toronto, unfortunately. They used to be the place where you go to see how good things were done, but I haven't, you know, we haven't done that in a while. But one thing that I do think Toronto does very well is engage with residents. And they have something called um, PIPs, which is Planners in Public Spaces. And they go to farmers markets, and they'll go to parks and put up a tent, and you get people, you know, just dress very casually with name tags and say, ask me a question. Here's the, here's the official plan, here's something that we're doing, here's some initiatives we got going on, do you want to tell me about your community, maybe I can help. And that's been amazing. So when people experience the planning system in a friendly way, then when they go to a public meeting, they're a little bit calmer, they're a little bit more self-assured, and they have better information, and then you get a better outcome. So that's, I hope that answers your question. But I, I generally very skeptical about public input because usually it doesn't go well. Because I've, I've spent six months, you know, with my head down working on a report, and then I go to a public meeting and present it, and all hell breaks loose, right? So I've really grown to say, look, we have an onus and a responsibility to engage in a, in, and educate and inform, and also to be educated and informed by the public as well, right? It's two-way street. Yeah, very much so. And one of the things that, um, that really stimulated our interest in Sean's work was, as Hartley said, um, a podcast that we, uh, that Shartley, Hartley found and shared with us, and it was about Sogging Shores, and it was the, the planners actually at Sogging Shores talking to Hartley um, on a podcast that was broadcasted through their, uh, their, their local channel, and it was very informal. It was actually quite fun, <laughs> and, and we were very impressed with that. So that and, and you talked on that one about public engagement and you know getting out and talking to the to the public and to members and also it's a two-way street you know we also have to take responsibility as residents um, in becoming more um, educated and more engaging um, rather than just waiting for the uh, you know the planning uh, the planning application to come through and and everybody's going what what how did that happen where'd that come from I don't want that so you know it's it's really a two-way street very much so I think yeah. okay all right another one are you ready for another one <laughs> don't worry I'll turn it over soon but we got some pressing ones that we really wanted to ask you <laughs> so. Please. okay so in Caledon this past week the mayor faced a very angry ca uh, crowd of citizens uh, just like what we we're talking about um, she was attempting to use strong mayor powers to push through a development um, of $2 million homes on one acre lots and they were gonna be placed on the Greenbelt lands. She claimed this was her one of her answers to the housing crisis and I think most people would agree that a $2 million home, dollar home on a one acre lot is not really affordable housing for the, for today, in today's world. Um, can you give us some suggestions on how developers um, could be encouraged to build truly affordable housing? even in Oromodonte. Because most of our homes in Oromodonte that are currently for sale in our big developments that have gone on are going to be over a million for sure. Okay, here's the thing. Um, as, a, as an academic and a planner, we, we generally tend to be at the very least centrist, um, mostly a little left of center, be honest. Um, but here's, here's the reality. The reality is that we have a market system. And the Oramadane plan has policies about creating complete communities in Horseshoe Valley and Craighurst and enhancing the environment through incremental development. But Oramadante does not build the homes. Toronto does not build the homes. Developers build the homes. Developers implement the plan. 
in, intrinsically, we have a, a market needs to make a profit. So how can we, so this is really a wicked question, is how can we expect a profit-driven system to provide affordable, seemingly at a loss, homes, right? So it just, it's, it, the math just doesn't add up. So I think government has a role, and quite frankly, a responsibility to provide affordable public or nonprofit housing. Um, and the federal government and the provincial government completely lost the plot. And I don't think it's any mistake that our, our uh, supply of affordable homes started about 30 years ago when the federal government, under the Liberals, um, turned off the federal housing tax for public housing. So I, I don't think the solution is through development. Developers will build whatever they can that is required and profitable. And if they build something that's not profitable, they have to pass on the costs of that to the other units, which actually makes them even less affordable to other people. So we're just, just you know, imagine blowing up a balloon and then squeezing it. That's what we're doing in our current system. So we have to pop the balloon. We, we need a different approach. Otherwise, we're just chasing our tails. And it's frustrating because we're a very, we're a very wealthy province, and we can we can do it. It's not a matter of can; it's a matter of do we want to. To be honest with you, so it's a choice, and we're not choosing to do it. Great answer, thanks. Okay, one more from me, <laughs> and then maybe we'll turn it over because I do have more others. Um, it seems that small municipalities have less and less control over their planning decisions these days. What recommendations would you make to members of council and to, the, and to our planning staff? How can they be empowered to affect changes that we're talking about? Look, I think municipalities, and I'm not pandering, just, just for the record, um, municipalities do really more and more and more of the, the heavy lifting. When we talk about you know, quality of life, it's really what municipalities do. It's the libraries, the meeting rooms, the, the meeting uh, centers, the, the parks, the quality of our streets, our public realm, our, our daily services, our water, our sewer. And climate change is important to you. We're not going to address climate change effectively at a federal le level. It's at the local level, right? It's the, the types of, of choices that we make, where we choose to build and not build, and the types of environmental performance measures that we make um, required for people to build and follow, we can do it. So I, I think that, um, unfortunately, a, a lot of pressure is shifting to mayors and councils to advocate um, the federal and the provincial government levels for more power or less funding responsibility. Um, I think um, uh, through uh, Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the Association of Ontario Municipalities, AMO, it's been um, quite an effective lobby group uh, for the federal and, and provincial governments. Unfortunately, it hasn't generated new public money for, for housing, right? Um, so. I, I think, unfortunately, um, it means more work. I think that um, municipal politicians and staff are already overwhelmed and, and overtaxed. They, they already have a lot of responsibility. Um, but unfortunately, I think that they need to use their power and the support of their constituents behind them to, to, to do a little political lobbying of their own, unfortunately. It's not fair. But I think that's the only way that things are going to happen. I do. So. Okay, I think it's time that we uh, turn over the mic. 
Is there anyone in the audience that would like to ask a question or even make a comment? This, this may not be your area of expertise, but I was wondering if you could shed some light on the differences in our planning systems from Ontario versus other provinces yeah. in, in Canada versus potentially how they do things globally. Are we doing things the best way? Um, and is there a way to improve them? Not, not that that's within our municipal powers, but is there lessons that we could look to pass on to the provincial government to say, hey, this is working really well in another municipality or another district, can we implement that here? That's, a, that's an excellent question. I, I hope everyone heard it. It's, look, the Ontario planning system is very unique in the sense that it's, I've studied, um, I actually, <laughs> actually have done a lot of research in, in this area. Um, I've studied planning systems in Germany, Australia, um, uh, all over Europe, um, the UK. Um, I did some research in Brazil um, fairly recently. And what I found is, is that the planning system in Ontario is probably the most bureaucratic system in the world. No, I, no, I'm not trying to make a statement. I'm just saying that they, that's, that's, it just is. Um, now, that's good for people like me uh, in consulting. Um, but I do think that we have to be honest with ourselves as professionals and say, look, is there such thing as too much planning? <laughs> Right? Is there such thing as too much of an onerous process? Another thing that Ontario has that no one else has is an appeal body. Um, the, you know, was called the Ontario Municipal Board, then it was the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal, LPAT, and now it's the, uh, what's it called, uh, what's it called, the, what's it called this week? The, the Ontario Land Tribunal, and who knows? Um, so, no, a, a lot of people have made a lot of livings, um, including myself, I'll be honest, based on the process. Um, so it's, I think it's a little bit too onerous, it's a bit too detailed, and the thing is, I think it's, I think too much planning is not good planning, because um, the quality of the built environment isn't any better in Alberta, or isn't, you know, any better, sorry, isn't better in Ontario than it is in Alberta or anywhere else. It's pretty much the same. It's, you're, you're forced to, to get along outside of Ontario. A lot of uh, colleagues of mine and friends have left Ontario and plan, um, become planners in British Columbia, Manitoba, and um, in particular Alberta, and they love it because there's no appeal process. So they're forced to just sit down and work it out. And they said not only does it happen faster, but, but people are, more people are happy because you better get a better result. So um, I, I don't agree, this may not be part of the question, but I don't agree with what the current provincial government is doing to quote streamline the process. I think it's harmful to the public interest. I don't think it achieves the type of planning goals, the housing goals that they say it will. And I also think that um, it's created chaos for municipalities and even for developers. We don't know, we literally don't know what act and rule applies because so many things have been um, repealed and, and rolled back and rolled up. And now through Bill 185, um, which could receive royal assent later this month, um, the appeal process is gone. How do we, how do we even grapple with that, right? So I, I think that uh, Ontario can learn from a lot of other jurisdictions. I think that um, there is such thing as too much planning. Um, and I think that uh, we're all capable, mature enough to work things out because we do it in real life, don't we? <laughs> to varying degrees of success. So I think that we can do it in, in planning as well. I'd be happy to go offline and give you some more details. But you're welcome. Good question. I have another question over here. Hi. Hi. I've had 30 years where- Are you nice? I'm, I'll try to be. <laughs> but you've just asked a really, you've given a really interesting answer. I've had 30 years in, in municipal government. And my experience is that the reason we have an appeal process is because politically, uh, in local government, we do not have a consensus to begin with. 
And so people need something to protect their interests. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about um, outside Ontario, you're forced to get along, must sit down and work it out, suggests to me that somebody has the final say, and I'm curious to know what it is and how are they forced to work it out? Because we find that we're not involved at the beginning. Right, right. We're involved at the end when right. it's usually too late. That's right, so. I agree. This, this may sound controversial, but I, but I come in peace. I think consensus is way overrated. I don't like consensus at all, actually. Um, look at anything great in, in the world, and I bet you that it wasn't done through consensus. Right? So I think, I think consensus generally brings a lot of meh, right? Um, because look, it, I've been in negotiations where I've been pissed off or the person across from me has been pissed off. But we both respect the process, right? Like you can still not like the result, but respect the process. You're like, I gave this up and I whatever, but you know, at the end of the day, I can live with that. So I think, I think we need, I think, I, I don't like consensus at all. Um, I think we need to all give things away and take things from the other side, just like in life. Um, I think that's, that's compromise is better than consensus. But here's the thing, compromise on the right things. Trade off the right things. I have a quick example if you'll indulge me, if you don't mind. Um, I had a, uh, doesn't matter where it is, so I'll just, I'll leave out names. But there's, there's this, uh, there's a creek um, in a very urbanized area um, further south. And there was a lot of development pressure around the area, and the creek was dying. Um, the conservation authority said, look, when you do develop, you have to spend some money and renaturalize this creek. You have to re-oxygenate it. You have to introduce native species. You can't pipe it any longer. It needs to breathe. So um, I was hired by a municipality to negotiate the renaturalization of the creek with a developer. And it didn't go very well. Um, I was told that it's ridiculous, that you know, why, why are we doing this? It's dead. Um, and then I pushed back saying, well, why not? We have a responsibility to do this. It's the right thing to do. And quite frankly, developer, you can afford it. So let's not, you know, let's not play around. Um, so it turns out that um, I lost. What has happened right now is that that creek was completely covered over, but it wasn't filled in. It was decked. And the water flow was improved, area flooding was improved, and a public park was built over top of it, which couldn't have been, which couldn't have happened had we maintained the naturalization of that creek. So I lost, but I also gained. We wouldn't have had a park, we wouldn't have had better water flow if it wasn't decked. So. Trading off the right things, I think, is important. Um, and making choices and allowing ourselves to maybe be wrong, I think, is a real, it's not easy. Um, you know, I'm used to being wrong at home all the time, so <laughs> whatever, I'm used to it, whatever. But uh, right, guys, are you with me? OK. <laughs> so um, some, some gender stereotypes are true. <laughs> Let's be honest. <laughs> so yeah, um, now who has the final say? Um, a lot of people, the way Bill 185 is going is that municipalities, when they amend their own plans, they do have the final say, which means that we have to get it right and it's not appealable. So actually, I think that we, we, I envision more of this happening, which is a very good thing. I'd rather have arguments on the front end than the back end, right? Because we, we learn more, we respect the tr process more, and we've engaged with each other. We've roughed each other up a little bit. We respect each other at the end of the day. Right. You know, just to add to that, and is that 
we seem to be in a place so often where it's confrontational. Like yeah. you said earlier, yeah. you know, we have somebody creates a, you know, a, an application for whatever, and then we come in as a public at, uh, you know, at the council meeting or at the development services meeting, and we're, you know, we're agitated at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, to try to get beyond that is really a struggle. Because really, if we understood and knew in advance or longer, or had some ability to actually influence, perhaps, or to engage or to negotiate um, before it ever got to that point, we wouldn't necessarily be at that point. Um, that's just been my observation uh, in the past. Yeah. We had a situation recently at our council, and I won't mention names here, but uh, where the actually our council was able to negotiate with the developer, and it turned out to be reasonably successful mm -hmm. and probably avoided an OLT. Yeah. So just an example. Yeah, we can work it out. Like, we can. Yeah. A lot of times it's a choice, yeah. right? But we have to be vulnerable. We have to stick our necks out and, and trust that the other person will do the same thing at the same time, <laughs> right? It doesn't always happen. Yeah. So I, I'm going to just add one really quickly because we're on the topic here, and that's just that around the official plan, okay? Yep. And you know, we're not experts. I'm not an expert, believe me, and I'm sure he, people here, probably many of them, know more about it than I do. But you know, the current official plan for Almodante is intended to serve as the basis for managing land use change in the township until at least the year 2031. Mm -hmm. um, it was the most recent version of it that I'm aware of was passed in 2022. Is it amendable between now and 2031, or when we get a new yeah a new plan? Yes, it's amendable under the under the Planning Act. Plans have to be amend uh, at least reviewed every five years. Okay. Um, now what what many of the the I forget which one because it changes literally like every two weeks. Um, it's it's easier to do urban expansions under the changing, um, uh, used to be that you had to do something called an MCR or a municipal comprehensive review to as part of your formal five year review process to say, hmm, do we need to extend the built boundary or the urban boundary or the community settlement area boundary? But in order to do that, you had to meet many, many tests including environmental caring capacity, servicing capacity, land needs, like do you really need the land, right? Are you, are you demonstrating that you can't grow in population and employment without taking more land? That's gone now. So it's, it's easier to be compelled to expand your urban boundaries. But if a, um, if a municipal official plan has very clear um, uh, guidelines and very clear direction on what its values and principles are. It makes it harder to do that. Um, but the good news is the onus passes to local council and to people like you. Now that takes a lot of work and a lot of guts, <laughs> but it could actually, it could actually give you more power, not less. It, theoretically. Do you not also have to deal with the overarching county government that also has a say through their official yes. and the oversight of the Yes, the it's a little bit different here, whereas you know the, the, the county has a lot of approval authority or an upper tier and a lower tier. Um, whereas a lot of it's it's easier when you're one tier, right? Um, we you mentioned Sogging Shores a few times. That was interesting because Sogging Shores was under the uh, uh, the auspices of Bruce County. And Saugeen Shores, I think, and I can say this publicly, I guess I am, is quite a bit more progressive than the county. Um, so it was, uh, it was sticking its neck out. And uh, it had to, uh, it, it, it actually was ahead of its planning authority, its parent, right? The, the kid knew better in this case. <laughs> um, and to the county's credit, because of the really good working relationship, I think, between staff, um, the uh, Sogging Shores was able to get their, their permit system through, um, whereas in any other place it may not have. So staff, re staff to staff relationships, I think, are really, really important. In that, I have a lot of questions, comments, but I'm uh, caught up on one of the 
the comments you had was the public interest. Mm -hmm. And how do we decide what the public interest is? Yep. And who is in the room and who's not in the room? Mm -hmm. And one group of people who's often not in the room, but who have quite an interest in the land are indigenous peoples. Yes. And when we're talking about planning and also the legal system that we live in, um, they have particular legal and political rights that don't often ref aren't reflected within our official plans uh, in terms of how we develop and where and where not to and all mm -hmm. these things. So there's how can we um, reconcile that reality, like the history of the land mm -hmm. and our legal responsibilities in our planning? So that's kind of one question I have. The other question I have as a farmer is that people may not know, but on average in Ontario, farmland prices are increasing about 10% a year over the last 10 years. So because as we live in this market system where land is a commodity, that those market forces have outstripped the capacity of young people to participate in that agricultural production. Yes. And so now the, just as we don't have affordable housing, we don't have affordable farmland. Yes. In, ergo no affordable food and we have a quarter of our population now can't afford to access food and we live in a rural community um, that's experiencing a rapid rural gentrification so it's not just yes. enough to say we can't develop there we need to have proactive programs that actually facilitate land access farmland access and support for young people to become farming so i'm talking about a municipal uh, farmland trust. Like here in Simcoe County, we have the Simcoe County forests, which are municipally owned forests that are operated at a revenue positive for the county. And they're one of the most, I think, sophisticated county forest programs in mm -hmm. Ontario, maybe across the country. Mm -hmm. And Simcoe County Farms is my proposal to have municipally stewarded farmland in perpetuity removed from the speculative real estate market yes. connected embedded within local community to yes. facilitate multifunctional social ecological benefit with indigenous governance integrated or indigenous co-governance of that land to meet our reconciliation agenda as well so those are some of my things then also engaging youth i'd love to see these posters in at all of our schools maybe on the wall or public spaces i think that'd be great in terms of the public engagement piece, but okay. I'll leave it at that for now. I think. Is that all? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, um, I have a response quickly. If that, that's okay. Um, I'll, I'll address the farm first because it's fresher. Um, I had a I had a funny story. Um, unfortunately, fortunately, all my stories are true. It's a, I've lived a very really tragic life. Uh, I, I uh, when I was younger, I had a development proposal. Uh, on farmland and the uh, like a new track subdivision and predictably the neighborhood went nuts um, notwithstanding that it was future urban area and the official plan and the the developer applicant came up to me after and he put his hand on my shoulder and he says you know I'm not much different than farmers I don't know what they're upset about you know, because in the in the, in the fall, I put in the pipes, and in the spring, the houses come up. <laughs> and then he walked away. <laughs> and I think I don't know whether to hug you or punch you. I, I don't <laughs> right. So you're right. The, the the development speculation does put pressure on on land. The, the speculative nature, and 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 I'm wondering how much of of that speculation is is priced into a lot of cost of housing and other things. And I'm glad you mentioned affordable farming because we talk a lot about affordable housing, but what about affordable retail, affordable services? We talk a lot about all of our official plans, including Laura Madani's, talks about environmental um, vitality um, and economic growth and entrepreneurialism. Well, if storefronts are expensive to, to operate, you're not going to have, you know, affordable retail is, and affordable services are almost as important as affordable homes because that makes for community, right? And then you have this nice trickle down effect of not having to drive everywhere because you do have someone who opened up an independent affordable business down your block. So you don't have to do that, right? Um, uh, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture, OFA, 
um, is quite, quite active in doing education programs. They have a partnership with the region of Durham uh, in the GTA where they go into high schools and they actually have essentially like a farming job fair to get people interested in not just agriculture, but the agriculture, the agri-food industry, um, which is a little downstream from what you're describing, right? So I think it starts with younger, younger generations to see farming as a bona fide um, profession and a public good. Um, and we, we all need to eat, <laughs> right? And I do think government needs to be a little bit more proactive in, in lowering the, the, the pressure on, on farmland from a price perspective, but also from an encroachment perspective as well. Most of the farmland uh, south of south of here is owned by developers. A lot of it. It is. <laughs> so a lot of those farms you see are not exactly what they appear to be. And that, that's th that, that has a threat, right? To food security, to intergenerational wealth transfer, and other things. So um, indigenous consultation, it has been a, quote, duty to consult um, law in Ontario for at least 20 years, I believe. And I've been fortunate enough to, to be in many. In fact, I just met with um, uh, um, um, an indigenous group last week as part of um, a municipal plan. Oftentimes, I, I, I get uh, asked to, to represent a municipality. And it's very humbling, as I learn. And what I've learned is if you want advice on how to steward the land, you ask Indigenous people. Because they have been stewards of the land for thousands of years. Ever since the, the glaciers receded, their footprints have been on the land. Um, the City of Toronto's um, reviewing their official plan currently, and they rewrote the sort of the introductory chapter, chapter one to the plan. And a few sentences in, they talk about truth and rec recreation, uh, reconciliation rather with Indigenous peoples. It's right in there. Um, and I think that thinking like Indigenous people is we have to take that a different, a completely different mindset. Is not what we can take from the land, but what does the land give us? It's it's a different way to put it, right? Um, unfortunately, I feel really dumb meeting with Indigenous peoples. They're infinitely generous and patient and kind because we're asking, under the law, we have to ask them what they think of this plan of subdivision or this new strategy or policy under the official plan. And there's really nothing anybody can do about it because the land's been, quote, disturbed for generations. And they, they're, they're very kind to say, well, maybe there's a way you can improve the environment and, and I'll sh we'll share with you some tactics and we'll share with you some history. And that's a beautiful thing. And I've learned a tremendous amount. Um, but I'm worried about indigenous, um, I'm worried about um, treating indigenous history as almost like an epitaph in our, in, our, in our communities. To have some indigenous art here, an indigenous name street sign here. We have to go deeper. We have to go deeper than that. Um, I teach at uh, TMU. <laughs> formerly Ryerson University, name change as part of Truth and Reconciliation. And um, I, I was actually very skeptical of the na name change, and I'll be honest with you, I still am today, because not because I don't believe in the gesture, but because it just might be a gesture. It's like we need to do the work. Just because we've changed our name doesn't let us off the hook. And that's what I'm worried about. Things have to be meaningful. We have to mean it. Um, name changes are easy, but the work is hard. Listening is hard. Using what you heard to change something, that's hard. It, but that, that's more important. So I hope that addresses some of your. Uh, it's a longer conversation. Oh, of course it is. But no, thank you for, for mentioning that. I'm uh, I have two questions, actually. 
The first one is fairly practical. My understanding of the planning process was that the municipalities would put forth a plan and it had to be approved. It had to be approved, okay, thank you. Had to be approved by the upper tier. In our case, it's Simcoe County. Yes. Has that changed recently? Because my understanding is that the province is taking away all the power, if you will, from the, from the counties. I don't know if I'm the best person to, I'm sure I'll be corrected, um, but <laughs> Maybe um, Peter can answer the, 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 uh, the province has taken power uh, planning uh, power away from some upper tiers, including York Region, for example. Um, but I do believe that Simcoe is still retaining its, its planning authority. Um, there's something called um, like delegated authority, Sandy. Sometimes um, counties will say, notwithstanding that we can you know, require that we approve all of your applications, they could say, you know what, we'll just approve um, certain applications that you know, have this criteria or an official plan amendment, but you take care of the rest, right? So there's ways it can be negotiated. And, and it varies, and I think that's a good thing. Um, but it does require a lot of dialogue um, between the upper and lower tiers. And a lot of that, I think, in my experience, is personality dependent. <laughs> yes, <laughs> to put it nicely. I, I, I agree. <laughs> my, my second question is about growth. Yeah. Is, can, we, can we continue to grow our population forever? In Simcoe County, or let's say Barrie, for example, can we, can we have five million people? Can we have five million people in Oramadonte? Because that's the way we're going. Oh, yeah, I, I, I don't know if we'll even get 50,000 people in Oramadonte, let alone five million. Well, I'm million, talking about 100 years from now. Sure, no, I, I, I yeah, I, it, it's impossible to say. I, but one, one thing that, growth is appropriate in certain areas and, and growth, is not a monolith, right? It, it, it can take different, I'm, I'm more concerned about not so much growth, but change, incremental change. Can we change what we currently have to suit our needs? How flexible is the, the housing and the retail and the buildings that we're approving today? Can they change as we change, right? And I think that is a better, maybe a better question, Sandy, for Ormadante. Um, well, well, my question would be, who's going to feed these people? We can't, if we pave over all of the farmland, we can't feed ourselves. So how do we cope with that? I was raised in Vaughan, mm -hmm. and, and when I was a kid, uh, it was all agricultural land. Yeah. There are, they're putting up towers now, mm -hmm. and I don't know how many millions of people there are there, but there's, mm -hmm. uh, so. Can we continue that forever? Because if we pave over all of our farmland in Simcoe County, who's going to feed us? So, yeah, I'm, I'm, it, so it's, how do you no, like no, that question? Yeah, I want Linda back. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Linda. No, I, no. Um, it's no. I think I think it's 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 good to have these conversations. Like, is growth inevitable? Should we just a, a, expect it to? to happen. Um, I'm more interested, I think, saying is change inevitable? Is, is I, th I think adaptation, those are better, better, better questions rather than just growth. Pardon? It doesn't answer the, the issue though. Right. Because we're talking population rather than change. Yes, correct. Um, a, a, a challenge of the, the population growth is that and no one seems to be talking about this. I, I don't know, correct me, if, you know, if you disagree with me, let me know if I'm missing something. Um, we're saying that you know, we're in a housing crisis. We have all this population growth. Where are we gonna house everyone? But part of the problem is not that we're growing, it's that, that household sizes are shrinking. <laughs> Used to be that you'd have the average household size in former Metro Toronto when I came to the city was around just over three, something like 3.1, 3.2 people per household. Now it's under three. So what that means, it doesn't sound like maybe a big deal, right? Because we're talking, you know, fractions. 
But when you have millions of people, it means that you need more homes to build, to, you have to build more homes to house the same amount of population, even before you grow. And I, I wish, when I say we, I mean, you know, professional planners, developers, academics, decision makers, everyone would, would I think that's, a, that's an issue that we have to confront. Um, and that's a part of the growth question, Sandy, is it's how we're growing as well. What's the upper limit? Yeah, you're right, there isn't, there isn't an upper limit. You know, you no, know, you're right, there isn't. And I think it's a fair question to say, should there be? It's a fair question. Younger generation are tending not to have children. Yes. Maybe that's the answer. But seriously, why would why would they want to bring them into this mess? Right. And then you'll have an economic collapse, though, too, right? That's why we're, the federal government is, is, is aggra aggra aggressively pursuing immigration, yes. because no one's having kids. Yeah. Yeah. I think Hartley has a question. Hi, Hartley. <laughs> Hi, Sean. I had hoped that you would address the, uh, uh, the question of community planning permits. And I wondered mm -hmm. if you could talk about it a little bit. And sure. As you were talking earlier, uh, it occurred to me that it, it, the conditions under which they occur may change with the passing of Bill 180. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, it, it's funny. Uh, I got a call from Saugeen Swords just last week, actually, asking me that same thing. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm off the meter now. <laughs> I, I have no problem giving free advice. Uh, but the, we concluded that Bill 185 has, would, would not impact the ability to do a community planning permit system. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit about what it means and what your thoughts are on the community planning permit? Oh, I'm geez. not sure most people know, well, know about it. All right, so for the next two hours, uh, <laughs> go to the washroom now. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, God, I, I, I don't wish that on you. Okay, so a community planning permit system, what it says is currently to get um, tracks of homes built or maybe just even one in a certain area you'll need to go to the committee of adjustment or maybe a plan of subdivision or rezoning or sometimes you'll need an official plan amendment what a community planning permit system says is it rationalizes everything saying look if you want to build this as long as you satisfy this criteria, that criteria, that criteria, that cri criteria in terms of a checklist form, then you get to build it and it's just a matter of planning permit. No public meetings, no, you know, uh, community drama. It's just, it's, it's expected that if you meet, you know, parking requirements, servicing requirements, certain height requirements, anybody can, can, can pretty much build a home anywhere in that permit area provided that it meets or it fits within a certain invisible envelope of height and density and number of units. I always caution people to say, be careful what you wish for, and this is what I told, you know, Soggy and Shores, and they hired me anyway, was, was that if you want to build more homes, you may, maybe, maybe a CPPS, a permit system is not for you. Maybe you don't need it. Maybe you just need to make your zoning a little easier to understand and less complicated. Or maybe you need to allow more home um, forms in more areas. And then, it's, and then you can form and it's just a building permit. Um, maybe you should focus on, on other things like financial incentives or nonprofit partnerships or disposition and use of public land. Um, for housing, maybe that would be more effective than a CPPS. The problem with a, a, a community plan, planning permit system is that it's front loaded. And what that means is you have to, to do all of the detailed planning and design work ahead of time because once you have a community planning permit system in place, it's not appealable. And it's very difficult to change. And you could literally be a resident, and one day you look out and you see what you've been seeing for years, and then the next day, beep, 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 and a backhoe is backing up onto your property to dig a, a hole, and there's no requirement for them to provide you notice. 
So it is, um, it's quite a leap of faith and it's, it's usually a, a used for heritage conservation districts and, and um, main streets. Um, I think a CPPS is probably better in smaller specific areas. And then if it works there, then you can extend it to other areas. But it's, it's, not, a, it's not a panacea. It's not one, one size fits all. Um, because again, we have to think why. So many people are caught up in process as opposed to, well, what is it that we want? If you want more homes that are affordable to more people, then that changes the entire conversation, right? Um, it's like, well, what land do we have? Do we have grants? Do we have a, a, a great church group that um, sponsors refugees and provides them homes? Like maybe that's a way to go, right? Depending on the need, right? So if you focus on what you want to achieve, you might get a better process than starting with the process itself. Um, okay, it was mainly a comment. Sure. Um, but if you want to comment on it, if you want to comment on it, that would be great. I also have, um, I have a few comments, but uh, one is um, most of you, if not all of you already know, Oral Madonna Township, 20% of it is um, comprised of the Oral Moraine, which is the same type of moraine as the Oak Ridges. Mm -hmm. Um, and should be protected, but you all know that. Um, in our old official plan from, I believe, 97 to 2021, um, it was mentioned in at least two thirds of the papers, of the pages, mm -hmm. um, and how it should be protected and avoid environmentally uh, sensitive areas, et cetera, the water, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this plan that came out, as far as I found out, it should have just been an amendment but it was completely repealed, and most people didn't realize that until it was too late. Um, I just thought I'd mention this, okay. So the people that did speak out, when council, like our current council's great, um, if they listen, that's great. Other councils did not listen to what people had to say, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, and, and this got pushed through a bit, and uh, here we are. It's not even mentioned, I think, in one page of 288 pages. It's like it doesn't even exist. So I was inquiring about that, and I found out that there was no provincial reason for that. There's no, there's no reason, there's no mandate. They just did that. Now, I could be wrong, but that's what I found out from three higher-ups that are in the know. Um, so I just thought I'd mention that, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and the two designated settlement areas are on the moraine. Yeah, they are, yeah. And it's only 20% of the area. It's kind of ridiculous, right? Especially mm -hmm. the core moraine at the top of the horseshoe. Um, so I thought I'd mention that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any comments for that. Um, the other one was, well, maybe I shouldn't get off topic. Um, okay, we'll stick with that. <laughs> I don't know if you have anything else. Well, I think the, I, I read the plan. I figured I have responsibility to to you know, try to at least pretend to know what I'm talking about. Um, so I did read the plan, and the um, there is quite a bit of mention about the moraine, if not by name, but in terms of the in, the ecological function that it provides and the importance of keeping development off of it. Or if you do, in the case of Craighurst and and Horseshoe Valley, develop on the moraine as as they are, make it worth it, right? Complete community, denser mix of uses, make the most of the land so um, you can you can control it. Um, I've done a lot of green belt research, which includes moraines, and there is quite a bit of settlement area within the green belt plan in in in, um, in Ontario. Um, so I think I think settlement and and moraine and other natural features don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive, but I think that the test for development needs to be higher, and there needs to be an ecological um, based approach to uh, how we provide services and infrastructure, and also the types of housing too, um, because what uh, I just finished a research project with my students at Waterloo, and they looked at a way that you know, we need to create affordable housing for farm workers <laughs> uh, on, on a lot of green belt and marine communities. And so that was really interesting. So I, I think that, that we can achieve some net 
benefits, notwithstanding some of the, the geographic and, and um, the loss of these environmentally sensitive lands, I think it's possible to have a net benefit if we also make it affordable uh, for more people um, and align that with other goals of the plan too that, that speak to um, food production, um, that speak to economic development and employment and keeping things local, right? So again, I, I made the comment earlier that, you know, make a compromise, but make the right compromises. And I think the official plan sets it up that you can begin to make the right compromises when it comes to the moraine. But it's, it's messy, right? It's an imperfect thing. Um, but, I, but I am hopeful, actually. I am quite hopeful, especially too that um, a lot of environmental systems for water and wastewater and stormwater management have become very, very, um, very good and very sophisticated and more affordable. Um, and that is an approach too. So um, I want to acknowledge your concerns, um, but uh, I, I was pretty confident in the plan that, that, that it would uh, make the best of it. Um. Okay, I could go on with that. Sure, no problem. That, no, I'm that's gonna, okay. No, it's okay, but I, I'm going to go off sure. to something else because you mentioned you were in Europe. Yeah. Um, so here, sprawl is taking it all, <laughs> as people say. Um, but in Europe, they have to build up. So, and they also use excellent, they have an excellent train system, which we should, I would believe, we should emulate instead of building more highways and roads. Yeah. Well, I just wanted your comment on that? Well, their, their cities have about uh, two to 3,000 years ahead of us. <laughs> they had quite a, quite a lead time. Um, I did some research on, on Frankfurt, for example, which is actually surprisingly quite comparable to, to Toronto. Um, and it was uh, one of the younger, uh, older cities in Germany at only 1,000 years old. <laughs> so if you, you know, if you start a wild, your, your fabric of development and, and the way that you layer development is different. So I do think that, that, uh, that we'll eventually get to a place we're just further behind. And, and uh, I do agree that we should have more rail. Um, uh, I, I would love to see high-speed rail in the Windsor uh, Quebec City corridor. We have the population. Um, we just need the political will, like like many other things. So thanks for your comments, Kim. Hi, Sean. I wasn't going to ask any questions, but it makes me nervous when I hear a land planner says that uh, marines shouldn't be exclusive. There are equal. There are ecologically functions on those moraines, the glacier till, yep, the filtering yep. of the water, the aquifers and all that. When we lose them, it's not a, oh, we'll bring them back. You cannot bring them back. That's right. So we're not asking for exclusivity. We're asking for the protection of those funds. We can't keep taking water. We can't mm -hmm. do aggregate extinctions. And we can't build major housing on those ecological functions. So it, it's just poor planning. It's, it's, it's not, um, so it's not exclusivity. It's the fact that the function is there. When you jeopardize it, you'll lose it forever. I, I, I agree, because it costs more to replicate a natural system than it does to use that which already exists. But I, so I didn't want to make, I, maybe you, 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 maybe I misspoke, or maybe you mis, misinterpreted my comment. Um, I wasn't saying that that you should, you know, develop on mass on the moraine or any other green belt. What I was saying is that um, you, if there, there's already development on the moraine, so what the Oromodonte plan and then many others are doing, such as Richmond Hill, for example, and Witcher Stouffville further south, that are on the Oak Ridges moraine, say, well, if there's already growth here. Let's draw a hard line, and if growth is going to happen, we'll just fill it in, and then we'll stop. We'll hold the line there. So we'll sort of fill in what we have, and then we'll call it a day. And that's what I'm talking about, saying that I... That's what we should do. Yeah, more yeah well, the, 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 the boundaries are pretty... pretty uh, there are hard boundaries on the moraine for Craighurst and Horseshoe Valley. And they are fixed, and the official plan is very clear that 
to use the remaining lands within the boundary, which is quite compact, you have to do a better job than what you've done previously. So environmental performance, density, mix, um, and walkability and other things uh, to make the most of it. Um, so I agree with you 100%. Um, it just, we have to use what we have wisely and draw the line and make sure that boundaries are firm. Um, that's not to say there, there wouldn't be future pressure, right, in the future. That's just reality, right? But I agree with you. I thank you. Another Marine <laughs> question. Um, in the Craighurst area and Horseshoe, um, yep. obviously the development is there and it's going to continue to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly ramping up in the Horseshoe area. Mm -hmm. And what we have seen from the developers uh, currently is the method of preparing their the land there is just to completely um, eradicate the tree canopy and then build their plan of subdivision right. in, which makes sense. It's the cheapest option for ah. them. Um, what I was wondering is, do you have some examples of communities where they've been able to successfully put uh, canopy protection measures in uh, for new plans of subdivision so we can see less of this activity? Yeah, um, recently um, Observatory Park in Richmond Hill had, a, had some um, old, old stands of trees and some trees that were not in woodlots, but isolated with right where they wanted to, to build. So the town of Richmond Hill had a pretty robust tree protection bylaw um, that was leaned heavily when they did the, uh, the plan of subdivision and the subdivision agreement. And in some areas, the roads actually veer around <laughs> the larger trees. Um, so it's, it's, it's certainly possible, and I do think that um, you know, developers will, will do whatever they can as fast as they can, but if they're, but if the rules are very clearly and, and, and uh, rigorously stated and can be defended on environmental bases, then I, it is possible. Um, there's been a lot of critiques on, on, um, on how practical it is for a municipality to rely solely on its tree bylaws for certain things. So I think that's more of a question for the lawyers, um, but I've seen it going both ways. But I, I'm a firm believer in, in that anything is possible. If it's the right thing to do, let's make it the right thing to do. Um, and developers will do whatever they're told to do to get permits. So if we're very clear and firm, we, and, and they will do it. I've seen it happen. <laughs> I have a question that was given to me, so I'll uh, read it. Uh, development in rural areas like Oramadonte tend to create, uh, tend to center on estate lots. Uh -huh. What are the dangers or risks of having this style of development dominate? Are the rural communities that are leading the way in less car dependent living and more aged friendly communities, and what are they doing differently? Oh boy. <laughs> uh. I, I, and at the same time, it'd be, it would be, um, again, it's about scale. You know, the, the, the um, I personally am, am not a fan of estate development, maybe, mainly because I can't afford to live in one. I don't know. <laughs> Just being very honest. Um, <laughs> Um, they're, 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 not the, they're not the best use of, use of land from a, from a planning perspective. Um, and they're also on private services which can link and they can you know, inadvertently contaminate you know, groundwater and other things and they're just not a very efficient use of land. But I do think that they have their place, certainly. But then again, it, it's about scale. Like would a very higher density mixed use Main Street type development be appropriate? for Oramadane where there was a state development before. Like, that's not a question that I can answer, right? There's certainly benefits to that, but there's also trade-offs. You have less forest cover, the, you'll, there'll be more people, there'll be more activity. Um, so I, I think, you know, again, ask us what's important, ask ourselves what's important. And I do think that a state development as well as high density development is appropriate in their contexts. 
Um, but I think it's fair to say that I, I, I would like to see less estate everywhere and, and more, more complete communities. Uh, that it doesn't mean that there aren't any trees or there aren't nice places to walk. It's just, it, it's just a different form. Hi, I'm, Hi. I'm a resident of Craighurst. Hi. And um, I don't know how familiar you are with the massive development that's going on in, in that area. I would say if it's, if it's within the past few years, I would say no. Okay. Um, well, there's a lot of houses suddenly okay. being built across from us. Um, so I guess two concerns or questions I have. Um, one is um, when this development was initially proposed, it required a change to the official plan because I live across from this development. Mm -hmm. um, when we purchased our property, we did make some inquiries with the planner as to what was going to happen to the area. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the development was supposed to be primarily the just south of us, the other side of Horseshoe Valley Road. Mm -hmm. Lo and behold, what's being developed now in our village of um, What's the population of Craigers now? 700, I think, was the last it was said. Okay. And, I mean, they're putting in 700 homes. So you're talking about a huge change, because I think the average, mm -hmm. they say, is three persons per home. Could be. Mm -hmm. um, so a number of us in the community, when they had a public meeting for it, and this is under the previous council, so it's no criticism of the current council, <laughs> Um, we, um, the, the, there was a couple of meetings, planning meetings or hearings that we all attended. We voiced our concerns. As far as we can tell, ZIP was paid attention to them, like nothing came of any of our concerns. Okay. Um, so what can we, so this is the first part, I guess my concern is, uh -huh. what can we as individual residents do? Because at that time, the developer that was purchasing this land area and planning the development was the same developer that uh, was developing Friday Harbor in the south end of Barrie, mm -hmm. and um, southeast part of Barrie. And, uh, well, they basically, the, the residents there tried to speak up against it. This corporation took them to, to court um, because they were objecting to it. So we as the local residents kind of backed off because we thought there's nothing mm -hmm. we can do. We, we can't afford to be taken to court. Mm -hmm. So what, mm -hmm. what can we do? Well, I think the, the I, I think with, is your concern that the development was happening at all, or was it the type of development? Because it's my understanding that that the Orobodonte always anticipated development in that area, um, at least for the past five to ten years. But is, is it not so much that development is happening? Was it the type of development, or the? It was uh, the scale of the development the and location because. Um, as I say, they had to change the official plan mm -hmm. um, in order to accommodate this development. Right, it was probably density, probably a density related, maybe, maybe they were proposing more homes than the original official plan intended. And that, unfortunately, that happens everywhere because from the time that the original plan comes in to the time that developers are ready, lands have increased in, in value. Uh, and also costs, right, of, of servicing and things. So um, unfortunately, that is, it's like booking a vacation at one, and then when you go to fly, they say, no, no, it's gone up. You need an extra $500. <laughs> and that does work with, with development as well. So I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not surprised. Uh, in terms of, in terms of uh, what, quote, unquote, what residents can do, I mean, there is an appeal process. Um, and you're entitled to an appeal under the Planning Act, regardless of any threats. Uh, and I know the developer you're talking about. <laughs> um, not going to say their name, but I, I know exactly. And you were probably right to not pursue. Um, however, uh, it would have been your right to, to appeal under the Planning Act, notwithstanding. Um, unfortunately, within a few weeks, your appeal right would be taken away um, by this current government. Uh, and I, I disagree with that. 
um, third party third party appeals will be eliminated. And so it puts more onus on yourself and your neighbor and all of us in this room to be more proactive. And how much time and energy and resources and expertise do you have to do that? Right? And um, I'm, you know, I work with a lot of residence groups. And um, I, I, they're, they're being outgunned. Um, and uh, I have some real concerns about that. So I think proactive, um, trying to insist your local councillor to have a meeting with the developer, even before applications are filed, if that's even possible. I have seen it in, in some cases where, where that does have a, a, a good result, um, but it does put the onus on the residents. So to, to be involved as much as you can to um, uh, make sure that the, the counselor are where you are, um, because most good developers um, far in advance of an application would have knocked on the counselor's door if they know what's good for them, right? So again, it, it, it puts the onus on you. But unfortunately, that's, that's the way that the Planning Act and all of the changes are trending. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that question kind of brings us right around full circle to where <laughs> Maybe, we started. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> you know, really, if you think about why we're here and what, we, what we're trying to do, it's really, it is really all about ensuring that people are more, um, more informed, more educated, more engaged in that process. And that's what our group is all about is mm -hmm. trying to get people more engaged in whatever is going on in the township. Mm -hmm. So I think Judith's question was a good one to end on, unless mm -hmm. anybody's got a really short question they'd like to ask before we finish. Oh, Alan, okay. You've covered a lot of ground, both of the questions and, and your answers. Thank you. Um, I think we're talking about a, a situation of balance. Okay. Balancing. Hold it up to you. Yeah, is that better? Okay. Question of balancing wants with needs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the complication is the process mm -hmm. and the person that writes the rules interprets the rules mm -hmm. but the rules are written by planners this is coming your way for the most part yeah and planners write in planners terms yes and they interpret the implementation as do lawyers mm -hmm. unfortunately the process ends up as you pointed out very well in confrontation yes and it's nice to say there should be uh, cooperation, collaboration. And it's difficult to get there. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of cases, we're discussing problems. Yes, And that's right. After the fact, you've heard some of that. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, sometimes fresh eyes looking at a township like ours, like from your perspective, is a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, although you were hesitant to say you come in and, and say this is what you should do. <laughs> but I would think in, in not solving a problem, but taking a fresh look at it, uh -huh. that you take an inventory of what's in the location. So if you looked at Ormadani and you said, these are your assets, these are your liabilities, sort of a fresh, mm -hmm. fresh slate, mm -hmm. where would you go? You know, it's funny. Um, I ask myself this question. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a hockey fan. I'm a baseball person. And, um, you know, the, 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 the Leafs, long, yeah, uh, it's an occupational hazard, right? Um, I was wondering, in the, in the miraculous event that the Leafs won, and they, let's say they, they broke the curse and won the Stanley Cup, the... Um, if there is such a thing, the, the Toronto Maple Leafs fan club of Oro Medante, where would they go to celebrate this miracle? And I, I was thinking about this. Is there a place that everyone can congregate within the township to celebrate something? And that started me thinking. Like it's, on one hand, the way that you have the plan, because this goes back to you know hundreds of years in settlement patterns, right? So this reflects what's been here for a long time. You're, you're, and I love Shanty Bay, for example. I mean, I just imagine what that would have been like 
when it was first formed and where the actual shanties were, right? Um, so it tells a story. But the, but the downside is, is that where's the critical mass? How do things hang together? How do people identify? Um, so it would be interesting to find a literally and figuratively central location within Oramadante to celebrate things, to, to have the community come together. That no matter if you lived in Horseshoe Valley or Guthrie or Shanty Bay or Moonstone, that you're like, you know what? This is my place. You can identify with that. And I think that that would be something that, that I would really like to look at. And uh, if I was running, um, if I was running Oramadante, if I was the CAO, or that I, I'd ask the council if I can have some money to do a study. <laughs> okay, Sean, I think you can sit. Okay. <laughs> you've been on your feet for a long time, and you've really done a fantastic job. And Thank you. Your energy is uh, is uh, uh, you know inspirational. Uh, is it? Thank you, everybody.